Good morning, Carlsville Baptist. How are you this morning? All right. Um, we are now in March. Can you believe it? Um, it is crazy how February just passed away so quickly. If you would, pull out your bulletins. There is a lot on the right side that we need to go over just very briefly, though. Um, starting with daylight savings time. That is next week. Do not forget to set your clocks one hour ahead. Um, because it's in the spring, you spring ahead. So that'll be next week. Um, so next week we'll be starting one hour ahead. And then also Easter lilies. If you would like to have an Easter lily, um, you have it into the church office. The only cost is not, or $10. And have it in by March 17th. We love to have a ton of Easter lilies up here. Um, it always gives that Easter vibe. Um, and it's in my opinion, they're very gorgeous. Uh, they're really gorgeous to have up here on stage. So if you would it, it, turn in those Easter lily money, it's only $10. Um, next is the Senior Adult Rally. That is Mar Thursday, March 14th. Um, so for all you seniors in here, you'll have a great time. It's going to be over at Northside Baptist Church. Um, and it starts at 12 o'clock. It's only $5 at the door is what it costs. So you come and be a part of that and have a grand old time. Let the church office know if you're planning on attending to that um, so, so we can be aware and let them know before Wednesday, March 6th, if you're planning on attending because we have to have a count of how many is going to show up by the 7th. So let the church office know by this Wednesday, the 6th. Um, also, nursery workers, we are in need of nursery workers. Um, we are in a transitional phase where some older ones are wanting to come out, and we need, we need some young, young people in there. Um, but even if you're older, come on, because we need some, we definitely need some um, nursery workers in there, uh, especially, um, Miss Melanie wanted me to mention this, especially for Easter. If any of you would like to volunteer for that Easter Sunday, please let Miss um, Melanie know um, so she can put you down. She definitely, we are definitely in need for that. And last but not least, it is, we're having the week of prayer um, starting actually this week. And Annie Armstrong Missions is one of the big focus of the prayer week. So with that in mind, we're going to show you a quick video of Annie Armstrong. For almost a hundred years, in big cities with a hundred skyscrapers and tiny towns with one stoplight, on college campuses and Native American reservations, and churches too many to count, Hundreds of thousands of men and women and boys and girls have made hundreds of thousands of life-changing decisions. Almost none of them knew her name, and yet she was there. Annie Armstrong lived more than a hundred years ago. Only this one picture of her survives. History could have easily forgotten her, but Annie Armstrong is worth remembering. In the late 1800s, when most women had no voice, Annie was one of the first to speak up. First, for the urban poor in her hometown of Baltimore, and then for Southern Baptist missionaries around the world who desperately needed support. It was for these people that she helped start the National Women's Missionary Union. As its first executive leader, she gave women a platform in their local church and in ways that they'd never done before. These women helped focus Southern Baptist attention on the hurting and the lost and the missionaries trying to reach them. Annie wrote letters, 18,000 in just one year. And she traveled across America, encouraging missionaries and inspiring churches to pray, to give and to act. She worked long hours, paid her own expenses, and refused to accept a salary. And in the darkest days of the Depression, right before she died, an offering was named after her. Today, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering helps missionaries in the U.S. and Canada start new churches and meet needs through Compassion Ministries. Over the years, Southern Baptists have given more than $1 billion to that offering, and 100% of it, every penny, has gone straight to the mission field. There's still work left to do. The need is bigger than ever. And that's why, even though she lived more than a century ago, and even though only one picture of her survives, 
Annie Armstrong's influence lives on. Because today in North America, just as it's been from the beginning, anywhere a missionary is sent, every time a new church is born, anytime someone gives to her offering so that a lost person might be found, Annie is there. Don't ever say that one person can't make a difference because that's proof of it right there. One person made a difference. Did y'all hear me? Letters she wrote in one year, 18,000 letters. That's unreal. I don't even know if I can write that many in a lifetime. But anyway, her legacy still lives on through us today. So if you would like to give to that Annie Armstrong offering, you can do that right in the offering plate as it's being passed. Just label it. Um, but... All of the money, all 100% goes straight to the missions right here in the North America, um, right here in the United States and Canada. Um, so just be mindful of that. And last thing, last but not least, on the very front of your bulletin, please be mindful of our Easter schedule. Um, it is a little bit different. Uh, we will, um, it's the same as last year, but we changed it last year. Just, so our sunrise will start at 7, breakfast will be at 8, Bible study will be at 9, and then worship at, Easter worship at 10. So just be mindful of that too. Take this home, put it on your refrigerator so you don't forget. Would you pray with me as we begin today's service? God, thank you so much for all of the things you do for us in life, all of the things you do for our church, and how you continue to bless us. God, we're asking you, Lord, for another blessing, that you just bless this worship service this morning. Bless this hour. May you keep our attentions focused on you and you alone in all that we do through song, through children's sermons, through Pastor Charles speaking, Lord, with his sermon. May you just really just tune our ears to what you would have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burdens. The nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? God's son would die to save a wretch like me. What love divides, he gave his life. His scars of suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crowns of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me joy untold his life for mine his life for mine how could it ever be that he would die God's son would die to say
This morning? Good. So, I need your help this morning because I'm a little nervous. I challenged Mr. Nathan to an arm wrestling contest. And I'm a little nervous about it. So, I've just decided that instead of doing that, I'm just going to hide from him. So, I brought a big blanket. So, if y'all see Mr. Nathan, I need you to tell me. Okay? Because I'm And so I'm just going to walk around like this the whole service, okay? Am I hiding very good? No? I just knew this was going to work. This doesn't work? I need, to bl- I need to find something gray and blend in, okay? Um, I don't see anything gray. Are y'all sure? Like if I, if I go out there and I just sit down and I put this over my head and I sit out there, he's not going to see me. lay down and be very still, okay? But then after church, he's going to, like, walk through here, don't you think, and make sure everybody's gone? Maybe. A walking blanket. That's what I want to be. But do you think he'll see me? He's still going to see me, isn't he? Do y'all see him? I would run into a wall. (laughs) It would be terrible. So this is not a very good hiding thing. No? You don't think I could hide like this? No. Why not? I can still be seen, right? So, that is kind of silly, I know. What do we do when we try to hide from God? What are some things that we try to hide from God? Do we try to hide the bad things that we do sometimes? Or maybe we hide it from other people so, like, if your mom and dad tell you to clean your room and you go into your room, you just shove everything underneath the bed? Do you do that? Mm, right? We're just pushing it away and hiding it and not taking care of it, right? And sometimes in our life, there are bad things that we do that we try to hide from God and make it so that oh, nobody knows about that, so it didn't really happen. But the thing is, what God's Word tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that nothing can be hidden from God. There isn't a single thing that we can hide from him for him to not know about or to see in our life. We might can fool people around us because they may not know some of the bad things, but God knows everything. So if we live our life pretending like we can just act like it didn't happen or hide it from God, walk around with a blanket on top of us so somebody doesn't, doesn't see us, we're really not being honest with ourselves because God sees everything. And you know what? Some people think that's weird or that's scary. But you know what? God intends that for us to understand that and to know that because God sees everything, he still chooses us. He still loves us. 
And that is a God that loves. And so instead of us hiding the bad things, we can go to God and say, God, I am sorry for what I did. I know that was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And you know what God does? God forgives. God forgives us for those things. He doesn't want us to walk around hiding things from him. He wants us to go to him and say, God, I am sorry. This is what happened. And when we do that, God can forgive us because of his son, Jesus. And that's something that's really, really beautiful. The world may teach us that God is just mean and judgmental and he doesn't care about us, but that's so far from what God's word tells us. The truth tells us God loves us so much that he sent his only son so that we can be forgiven of the sins that we have. And God does know all things, but we can go to him and ask for forgiveness for those things. And that's something that's really, really beautiful. All right? Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us. And God, even though we try to, in our own way, hide from you, um, we try to hide the things in our life that are separating us, the sin in our life that separates us from you, Father, we just pray that we recognize that nothing can be hidden from you. That when we act like we can, it's like we're walking around in a blanket thinking that people aren't going to see us. Father, you love us. You care for us. You sent your son to die for us so that we can be forgiven. So God, help us to understand each day that the things in our life that are bad are separating us, Father, we just need to go to you and confess those things. Father, there's nothing to be hidden from you. And that's so beautiful that you care for us that much, all individually, that you know us that closely. God, help us to understand that even more today. In your name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we really are in awe of you, and we owe everything to you. Um, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone here. Um, I thank you for this church, and I thank you for Nathan and Pastor Charles. And uh, God, I just pray that you will bless everyone as we go out the rest of this week. And I pray at this time that you will bless this offering. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Once a strength. 
Have you already been blessed this morning? Amen. Amen. Yeah, the music has been outstanding today. There's just something about music about the cross. It just really brings you closer to God. It really touches your heart. Uh, everything this morning was so beautiful. Thank you to everyone who sang, everyone who played an instrument. It was all so good, and thank you so much. If you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today so thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to go to the cross and die for our sins. Father, I thank you for this time of year when we reflect on what Jesus did. We reflect on his life here on this earth and the ministry that he had and the mission that he accomplished when he went to the cross. Father, help us today as we look at the cross to see and understand your wisdom behind the cross. Man doesn't get it sometimes, Lord, but help us today to see the purpose and everything about it. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you've noticed in the world today, in the pop culture and in the athletic world and in other places, the cross is being worn by so many celebrities. And most of those celebrities have no clue what the cross really stands for. They're just using it as a fashion piece, just a fashion statement, and really do not care what the cross even means. For us today that are here, we know. But we're living in a culture in America today that is based on man's wisdom. Not on God's, but on what man can understand. That is to be expected when somewhere between 68 to 70 percent of the world's population rejects God. And therefore, it is totally dependent on what man's wisdom is. Also, Christianity continues to shrink here in America. In 1990, about 90 percent of Americans claimed to be Christians. But in 2023, only 64 percent claimed to be a Christian. Secular humanism, or what would be called man's wisdom, is controlling much of our country's political, educational, social, and moral agendas today. We see it every day in the news. We see it in every political ad. It's just one, and what man can accomplish, what man can do. With the growing strength of secular humanism, God is being ignored in our nation, and Christianity is being minimalized. Most people have no clue what, where true wisdom is found in America today. If you were in Sunday school today, we talked about the beginning of, God, of Christ's mission here on earth and how John cried out in the wilderness calling people to repent of their sins. That's where we are in America today. We as Christians are crying out in the wilderness for people to repent. Fortunately for those who know Christ, we know that God is still God and He is still in control. We also know that salvation is found only through the cross of Christ. But we still need to understand what the world believes, secular humanists, the ones that trust their own wisdom. Where are they coming from? Why do we need to know that? So we will be able to better witness to them. People, they're not going to change until they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And it is our responsibility to share with the lost about Jesus Christ. So let me help you to understand today, even as I need to understand, what secular humanism is all about. First of all, it is not new to the world. It, existed, it has existed for thousands of years, even before Christ came to earth. Paul faced it in his ministry to the Jews and to the Gentiles. He dealt with the Greeks, and if any, any group ever thought they had it all figured out in man's wisdom, it were, the Greeks did. And that's what Paul had to deal with to reach them for Jesus Christ. So Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 18, for the message of the cross. This morning in the song the choir just sang, did y'all see how beautiful it was up here behind them as the cross was on the screen and then the crosses across the front? That just pulled my heart as I looked at the cross. For the message of the cross is foolishness, 
foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Think about that in our culture today. Those who think they are wise, and yet everything they, they stand for is simply foolishness. Why is the way of the cross foolishness to man's wisdom? It is because man's wisdom is based on these false deductions. I want you to listen to where they're coming from in the world today. The first false deduction of man's wisdom is atheism. That is, there is no God. And there is a growing number of people in America and around the world today who are accepting atheism as the way they look at eternity. They believe that there is no God, and because there is no God, then man is supreme. They believe that there is no supernatural being who has created everything and is in control of everything. Therefore, they believe that man is in control of everything, and we make the choice and decide what we're going to do. They think all of this just happened by coincidence. It just came about by chance. That is where atheists are coming from in our world today. Because of their beliefs, they believe that when you die, you no longer exist. That's it. All you have are your years on this earth. Death is final. They have no idea of hope of life after death. Can you imagine living like that? No hope of an eternity. That is why the message of the cross is foolishness to them. And it will only be by the power of the Holy Spirit convicting their hearts that they will be able to see the truth. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. I know we're taught when we grow up not to call anyone a fool. But look what it says in God's word. The fool, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Atheism is foolishness. The second false deduction of man's wisdom is evolution. This is the belief that man evolved over millions of years until he reached his present condition. Well, isn't that a sad state to think it took millions of years to get in the mess that man is in today? I mean, isn't that pitiful? There is no scientific proof of evolution at all. I don't care what they keep theorizing. It is just a theory, and it's not the truth. They try desperately to explain such evidence and tell us that it exists, trying to convince us that what they believe is real. We know the evolutionists are wrong because we accept what, what the Bible teaches. Listen to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, what it says about man. I didn't come from a single cell in a pool of dirty water and then split and keep coming till I got to a, an ape and then to man. That's all made up. Here's what the Bible says. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is what it says in God's word, and this is how we, came. we have come into being. And we're not millions of years old. We're somewhere around 6,000 years old, if you'll look at the timeline of God's word. And that, I want to point out some things here in this passage to you that we need to understand. Evolutionists are part of the reason that we have put every cre creature on earth on the same level. I mean, it is ridiculous today that people think dogs and cats and horses and roaches and uh, spiders and all these things are equal to man. And they should have the same rights that we do. That is foolishness. What does it say here? God created us so that me, we may rule over 
rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and over the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. God put us in charge because why? We are the only part of creation made in his image. Everything else was made for our enjoyment, for our pleasure. It was not made to be made as a equal with humanity. And that is where these crazy evolutionists have brought us in the world today. I cannot believe some of the things that I'm seeing about animals today and where people are placing them on such high pedestals in our world. So we've got to understand that evolution is wrong, but that's what they believe. The third false deduction of man's wisdom is that man is merely an animal. That's what I just talked about. Therefore, they do not accept a fixed moral standard of behavior and that produces happy living. They prefer that man lives to satisfy his urges. This is where all of the acceptance is coming from today of all the sexual sins out there that are now being called normal that are now being called, well, that's the way the animal man wants it to be. That's what his nature is. No, that is the sinful nature of man that has been created in God's image. And that is the devil using these sexual desires to pull man away from God's will in his or her life. And that's what is happening to the world today with everything. It just is so confusing. I don't know how people handle living in that world if they believe these things. I mean, I saw some new pronouns this week that I've never heard in my life. They're the most made-up, foolish things I've ever heard, but because a man doesn't think he's a man anymore, he's supposed to be called Exum or something, I don't know what, something foolish. And then a woman that doesn't think she's a woman anymore is supposed to be called Xer or something like that, just foolishness. And how do they keep up with all this stuff? And then a man becomes a woman and then falls in love with the woman. Why didn't he just stay a man to begin with, you know? <laughs> I just don't get it. But that is the foolishness of man thinking that they're in control and we're just an animal and we're just doing what animals do. I got news for you. The animal world even doesn't operate like that. I mean, we are just being stupid as human beings today. I know animals, if they can look at us and see this, they're laughing at our foolishness as they watch mankind. As Christians, we trust in God's moral order of life. That's where we're coming from. We know that the wages of sin is death, as stated in Romans 6, 24. Therefore, we see the necessity of Christ, of Christ dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we understand that there are things that are sins, that these are things that God did not create us to do. These are things that God does not want us to do, that it interferes in our relationship with him, and we should not have that in our lives. And we know as human beings that we need to repent. But those who think that we're just animals, they don't get it. They don't get it. Then there's a false deduction of human wisdom, and that is that man is innately good and only needs the right environment to improve his quality of life. This is what is taking over in America today. Oh, we've got to put everyone on the same playing level. Everyone's got to be on the same, uh, uh, have the same uh, material things and the same quality of life and all of this. I'm telling you, as human beings, this is not possible. It is not possible. And they, they're trying to take away law enforcement so that that doesn't cause oppression. Look at the cities that have reduced their law enforcement. They are being destroyed. Seattle is a joke. San Francisco is a mess. Los Angeles is ridiculous. Austin, Texas, of all places, has become one of the most dangerous cities in the United States because they have taken away law enforcement. This is where human wisdom says that man is innately good. And if you just let them be, they'll be good and they'll, everything will work out great. No, man is innately a sinner. We're born sinners because of Adam and Eve. 
And if we do not come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that sinful nature will continue to grow. And that sinful nature will lead to all of the bad that we have in our world today. Ladies, if you're not aware of it, even here in Sumter, South Carolina this week, a lady, a teacher, I was told in Sunday school today, a teacher went to the food line where the bilo used to be on the other side of town. At three in the afternoon after school, she was coming out of the bilo. Two men with masks on came running out of the woods beside bilo, grabbed her purse and took off. That's right here in Sumter, South Carolina, ladies. That is where the state of humanity is today in our world because they are denying the cross. They are denying Jesus Christ in their lives. So the problem is it is not true that we are innately good. That's the problem. Welfare programs have failed over and over in America. Over $6 trillion have been spent to eliminate poverty in America since President Johnson's Great Society programs of the 1960s. It is only proven to be a total failure, a total failure. Banking on the innate goodness of man has only led to millions of fatherless children, drug abuse, rampant crime, sexual perversion, and human misery that has destroyed humanity in the world today. It is beyond belief what is happening in America. We as Christians know that the Bible teaches this about man, not that we are innately good. In Psalm 53, 3, it says, Everyone has turned away, all have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. That is why we need the cross, because only the cross can save us from our sins. Christians know that we can only be made good through the power of the cross. There is one last deduction I want to share with you this morning. I know this is depressing to think that's where we are as humanity, but we are. The last one I'll talk about, a human deduction today, deals with the government. Humanists embrace socialism. That is what's happening in our country today. One of our political parties is embracing socialism. And this is what socialism is about. Socialism believes in a one-world government that has control of individuals, institutions, and agencies. They believe that with that, such control, they can bring about complete equality and world peace. They're trying to get everything under the control of the government so that the government can tell people what to do. Not that we have a government that we tell what to do, but the government tells us what to do. People, you need to pay attention in this election year because the devil is at work and the devil's trying hard to destroy America because America is still one of the countries that Christians still speak out boldly about Jesus Christ. And the devil wants to shut us up and he's doing it by the United States government. That's one of the tools that he is using. And we need to be paying attention to what's happening in our government. A twist to this thought in America is that government doesn't need to own everything, just control everything. With, with socialism gaining popularity in our nation, we can see the weakening and destruction of our country. We are almost could be classified as a third world country now. It is unreal when you go through. Cindy and I went to a town we hadn't been to in a long time, really close to us. You can just take it in about a 40-minute drive from here. And we were shocked, shocked at the number of homeless people in that town now. It was unreal to see how many homeless people were there. They're there because of our socialistic movement in government today. They are destroying the country. California is a prime example of the destruction brought about by socialism. I'm telling you, God is causing all of these things to happen in, Ca in California through nature. They're getting 10 feet of snow. They're getting floods. They're getting landslides. They're getting massive fires. They're getting earthquakes. You name it, it's happening in California. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like the plagues in Egypt to me. God is trying to get their attention. I'm telling you, I will not be surprised at all if we don't see on the news one day where a great earthquake has happened and California has fallen into the ocean. 
That wouldn't shock me at all because God did it to Sodom and Gomorrah when they would not turn from their wicked ways. And God will still do it today. He is the same God today. Now, the problem with socialism, this will be knocked off of Facebook if it hasn't already. The problem with, so, because the, 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 the socialists control Facebook, I promise you. The problem with socialism is that it depends on the wisdom of man. The Bible says in Psalms 1-6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. In Isaiah 55, 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. People, we have got to turn to God. We have, let, have to let Christ be the Lord of our lives if we're going to get through this world. We cannot depend on our government. We cannot depend on man's wisdom. We must depend on God. So we can see that man in all his wisdom all his wisdom cannot save himself. The more we try, the worse it gets. We can only find salvation in God's wisdom through the cross. That is the only place that man can be saved. Paul goes on to tell us in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 21 through 25, For since in the wisdom of God the world, though its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look to wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. There's only one place that we can found, find salvation, and that is at the cross. Only through Jesus Christ can we be saved. So let me ask you, where are you putting your hope today? Is your hope in the wisdom of man? All of these things I just talked about, or is your hope in God's wisdom? And God's wisdom gave us Christ dying on a cross for our sins. Man's ways leads to destruction. God's way through the cross leads through victory over sin and eternal life in heaven with him. Are you putting your hope in God's wisdom? Or are you putting your hope in man's wisdom? As we come to our invitation today, people, we as Christians, we have to get serious about this thing. There are people dying every day around us that do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. They're listening to the things of this world, to God's wisdom. Christians, we have to be bold in our message to lost people around us. We cannot wait. We do not know when the next person is going to get killed in a car wreck or when the next person is going to overdose, or the next person is going to get shot and killed by a random bullet. We do not know when that's going to happen. So the ones that we know that are lost, we need to be talking to them about Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I'm urging you to listen to God's wisdom. He put the cross there for you. Jesus died on that cross for your sins and for my sins. And when we accept what he did for us on the cross and we believe in Jesus and accept him as our Savior and Lord, then our sins are washed away, taken away from us, and we are made pure in the eyes of God and restored to him for eternity. We don't have to depend on science. We don't have to depend on politics or anything else. We just have to depend on God. Christian, if you've listened to some of these things of this world and you've bought into some of these things, please let God convict you of those things in your heart today and let them go. Get back to God's truth. Don't let the confusing things of this world keep you from being everything that God wants and needs you to be for Him in His kingdom's work. Would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? 
Father, I thank you today as we begin our trip to the cross, Lord, through this March as we approach Easter. And today, Father, we looked at your wisdom versus man's wisdom. You knew the only way that man could be saved was by sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. God, the world still does not get that. Most of the world still thinks that man's wisdom can save man. It, we know that it cannot, Lord. So convict us today to be bold witnesses for you. Father, for someone here today that does not know Jesus, may even today they come forward and confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord on their li of their lives. And Father, all of us know people that are lost, and we don't know when they're how much longer they're going to be with us, how much longer they have a chance to accept Christ as Savior and Lord. So help us, Lord, to be bold, to be witnesses to these people. Father, guide us to now as we go to, the, to your altar, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Guide us in what you would have us to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.